Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're eager to begin this conversation on a topic that uh, I believe, despite its importance, does not receive enough attention or philanthropic support in the global development space. I am Tim Hanstead. I am the CEO of the Chandler Foundation. The foundation is the philanthropy of New Zealand-born and Singapore-based businessman Richard Chandler. Richard's philanthropy spans decades and it began with the founding of Geneva Global to him joining as a, a founding core partner of CoImpact, a systems change donor collaborative to the creation of the Chandler Foundation. And at the Chandler Foundation, our mission is to help build strong and healthy nations that provide all people the opportunity to flourish. We do that through social investments, but we also do it through partnerships that elevate important ideas, topics, and organizations. And our focus is on supporting systems changing work that improves governance or makes markets more fair and vibrant. So let's get on to the program. Our moderator for today's discussion is Matthew Bishop. Matthew is an author, a journalist, a social entrepreneur. He's the co-author of Philanthropic Capitalism, the co-founder of the Social Progress Index, and the former US business editor at The Economist. We're fortunate to have him here today. And with that, my pleasure to hand it over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Tim. Um, and uh, hello to you wherever you are in the world tuning in today. Um, it's my great honor to moderate uh, these uh, discussions this morning. Um, and I want to quickly begin by uh, introducing our panelists. Um, I'm going to start uh, with a half hour conversation with Her Excellency Madam President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, um, who is founder of the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Presidential Center for Women and Development, having uh, really let, having pioneered uh, uh, leadership in Africa uh, in, in the context of rebuilding a, a, develop, a failing state, uh, the Republic of Liberia, as president from 2006 to 2018. Um, and um, she was Africa's first elected female head of state, awarded the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize for her critical work involving women in the peacekeeping process, founder of the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Presidential Center for Women and Development, which we'll talk about later, um, and co-chair of Emerging Public Leaders, which we'll also be discussing later. She's been co-chair of the World Health Organization's Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, and is generally uh, playing a fantastic role as a, the, in promoting <laughs> peace, justice, and uh, democratic rule, and giving voice to people everywhere, particularly women and girls to reach their true potential and achieve their dreams. Uh, after I've uh, spoken uh, with Her Excellency Madam Johnson Sirleaf, we will then have a separate discussion after she leaves us with um, two extraordinary pioneers of good governance, better governance. Um, one is uh, Yawa Hansen Kwao, who is the Executive Director of Emerging Public Leaders, uh, which is an organization that was really formed uh, to work with President Johnson Sirleaf uh, in bringing uh, young leaders into government. Um, she was previously uh, the founder of the Leading Ladies Network, a nonprofit that fosters female leadership and social entrepreneurship. She's an Eisenhower Fellow and an awardee of Africa's Rising Leaders, member of the Foundation Board of the West Global Shapers Community of Young People, and the Board of Directors of Aheshashi. Uh, university and former leadership consultant to UN Women on capacity building for women leaders in East and Southern Africa. And then we also have um, Wu Wei Neng, who is executive director of Chandler Institute of Governance, uh, executive, the executive director of the, the Chandler Institute of Governance, working to build government capacity through training programs, practical research and advisory partnerships with governments, the adjunct appointment at, at the Center for Livable Cities, Singapore Ministry of National Development, the Singapore Civil Service College. He's had extraordinary experience in public policy design implementation in the Singapore Ministry of 
trade and industry, which is really renowned around the world as one of the great civil services and has conducted training programs for over 3000 government officers for more than 60 countries. Um, so um, I'm going to be begin uh, by turning to uh, Madam President and um, it's an honor to meet you again, having uh, spent some time with you at the Rockefeller Center's Bellagio, Foundation's Bellagio Center a couple of years ago when we were really addressing the challenges of, of, of states that were grappling with uh, internal mm. capture and crisis and, and the importance of uh, a global response to those challenges. And at the time, um, you know, you were, you were very much, uh, there was a lot of questioning about having accomplished all that you did in your, in your two terms in office. Um, how would the transition go? Um, how do you keep momentum going? And before we dive into some of the, the broader topics around good governance and what could be done to promote them, it would be great to get a little update from you as to um, how things have been going in, in Liberia um, and, the, and the processes that you, that you put in place. Um, thank you, it's good to once again uh, meet you and and join an event in which you know, you're you're playing a part, and we have a chance to to talk again. Um, as you may all know, I um, led the process of a transition into a newly elected um, government and turned over to the president in January 2018, uh, having already put in all of the uh, fundamentals for reconstruction of our country. Uh, since then, I think through some continuity, uh, things that we have put in place are still being maintained. Uh, the new agenda of the, of the new government um, is somewhat changed. But I, I think uh, the objectives and the goals are still the same. How do we use our natural resources to bring much more prosperity uh, to our people? Uh, we don't have the as much uh, capacity because uh, the new government has a lot of young people and brought in people that haven't, don't have the required level of education, expertise, and experience. And so it's gonna take them time to build that. Uh, but we're very glad that uh, in what we have done, particularly in improving the quality of governance in the civil service, as a result of that, we are proud that they have a co of workers at that very critical middle level that today are carrying out uh, the functions that are required for efficiency and for accountability in the government. And so we need now to see how we can strengthen them more, how we can expand the numbers, uh, having 100 plus in the civil service, no matter how qualified and committed they are, is just not enough uh, to run a government that is growing, an economy that, that is expanding. And so we'd like to we like to see much more done, not only for Liberia, but the, that what I'm saying, you know, is true for all the many other countries. And as we discussed the whole area of governance and what, what can be done to strengthen uh, efficiency and performance at that critical middle level, I hope we'll have an opportunity to talk about that, you know, as our discussions go on. Absolutely. Um just uh, this moment in the world history is, is obviously a very turbulent one. Um, the last couple of years have, have had the pandemic on top of, you know, a lot of um, difficulty around populism emerging and bad government examples that I think we've seen. Um, we now have a, a new administration in America that um, is looking to re-engage with the world in a, in a leadership role. What advice do you have uh, for that administration, for the Biden administration as they re-engage? And in particular, how would you like to see them re-engage uh, around this issue of promoting better government? Well, let me first say how pleased I am, and I'm sure most Africans and 
millions around the world uh, are that uh, the Biden administration is now um, leading, leading the world as the United States has always done. And we want to also say how pleased we are that uh, the one chosen for his vice president is a woman, an African-American woman. Um, there are many so things that the Biden administration has already done that uh, well responds to the call for change. Um, they've also now agreed to rejoin the World Health Organization at this critical time when the world is fighting COVID-19 in all of its variants. Um, uh, the fact that um, they have now said that they will once again lead the multilateral, multilateralism effort to bring together everyone, not only to fight COVID-19 and what other pandemic may be lurking around the corner, but also to ensure that we put back in place those democratic principles that the world seemed to have lost over the last several years. That the leadership that the world seemed again not to have had over these years, that once again, we can look forward with hope that the Biden administration is going to come back bringing into leadership that which we're accustomed to having with the United States leaving the world. Uh, we also pleased, um, if I may say from a point of view of a personal point of view that the appointment of Linda Thomas Greenfield and the fact that, you know, she's very strong diplomat. She has served in my country, Liberia, has served in many other African countries and has demonstrated uh, such strong diplomacy and commitment to the principles and values of the United States, seeing her in the United Nations will be a big plus, you know, for bringing back some of what we know uh, has been the, the strong elements of, of a democratic society and the, the fairness and justice that's required, the strong governance with accountability you know, and integrity. So we, we look forward to that. I, we, we also have them appointed someone we know at our uh, E.J. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Center for Women and Development, Ralph Bonjari, who will now take over malaria, malaria of an area of concern to, to Liberia and most of our West African country, uh, which is just another form you know, form of um, a health a health scourge that has constrained us in in reaching some of our goals in the healthcare system. So, in that we we look forward to a Biden administration that's strong, that's going to address the true leadership, the global inequities and injustices that have been that has brought about a strong call for change and for action for a new world order. Building on that, um, you know, in the past, I guess, America and the broader international community hasn't necessarily done a great job of supporting uh, local government, local leadership. It's been more bringing its own agenda to bear. Are you, are you looking for, are there distinctive things that could be done now that would help really empower the best leadership on the ground rather than sort of impose diktat from abroad? Well, I do hope that they will look at, in the health system, they will look at supporting the critical areas of frontline community health workers. That's not an area that, you know, uh, assistance have focused on in the past. We have focused on the professionals, the doctors, the nurses, you know, the health health uh, facilities and all of that. Now I think we'd like to see them shift to the place where the real responsibility uh, for first action will come at that local level. And that that will also lead to strengthening 
local governance, another area that has not really been touched through the aid program since we've concentrated on the big ministries and agencies. We've concentrated on non-governmental organizations. Uh, and I think if we strengthen local governments where most of the, the needs that for implementation rest there, because if they're not performing at those levels, uh, they can undermine any progress, no matter how well planned and how well those who are the professionals uh, or those who work at the center in government, you know, have have um, planned their program. So we hope that will be some change. We hope also in the private sector, we'll see more focus on small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, those are the ones that create more jobs. The are capital intensive uh, industries uh, function with automation and yes, they create uh, the support uh, increases in G in in GDP, but at the end of the day, they're not the ones that improve the prosperity of the greater number of people in the country. So we hope again, the, um, the aid programs will be restructured in such a way that emphasis will be placed in those areas that have really been neglected over time. Now the theme of our conversation broadly over this hour is how do we um, restore trust in government, um, address some of the perceived or actual failures of, of government around the world that have led to trust in government, I think, falling to sort of unprecedented low levels. But also, how do we make going into government and, and, and doing public service in that way attractive again to, to young people and indeed older people as they, as they think about how to spend their lives? What do you see as the essence of the challenge that we're facing today? Better training for young people, young graduates from college, post-college, training them in, in a very professional way, having them in a mentorship programs with other professionals of higher caliber to be able to carry on the basic functions of government. Yeah. Too many times, the highly executive positions that do the planning, that formulate the agendas, are not the ones that are going to implement. It gets implemented down in the area of the civil service. That's where the difference comes, whether a program is implemented successfully whether you have the level of accountability and transparency that's required in good governance. The best plans will not achieve the goals that are set unless you have enough training in that area, compensation to reduce their vulnerabilities, mentorship, to enable them over time to achieve the level of experience that's required. Those are the areas that we have tried a bit in our small program in Liberia to, to focus on. And because of that, we think today in a government that is truly undercapacitated would not really be functioning with in the basic areas of carrying out their own agenda if they did not have this category of young people that had been trained. Um, there, there are also you know, opportunities for higher levels of training for these young people, bringing them in at a time of graduate or postgraduate, but also enabling them to have additional opportunities to experience We'd like to see some partnership with the private sector. If these people are trained properly and the private sector can partner with government, these are the ones that are going to build a strong private sector, which is essential for sustainable development. 
Uh, and I hope that new policies that will come from these calls for change will begin to focus on these areas of governance. Um, we've seen uh, democracy threatened over the years, over the last few years. And by that, you find a lot of authoritarianism creeping back, you know, into countries. And unless you have people who have been trained in certain values and certain principles, uh, it will easily find an erosion in uh, policies that have been says the failure to implement those policies effectively. Now, in a recent article you wrote for The Economist called From Kleptocrats to Technocrats, I mean, I, I guess you touched on a number of these issues, including um, the perception that's out there that government is a, isn't functioning well, that it is more about people lining their own pockets than doing uh, right by their people. But also you do, you do say that the voices of young Africans are calling for more democracy. So, the, so despite all the setbacks, you, you feel there is still a huge hunger for, for democracy in Africa. I really think there is. Um, there's every attempt to do perception surveys, Afrobarometer, Mo Ibrahim Foundation Statistics, the Mo Ibrahim Index of Governance, uh, have shown conclusively that people, particularly young people, prefer the, the uh, democratic system of government. The perception that persists today by the young people, and sometimes beyond young people, uh, that government does not function, that government is not demonstrating the level of accountability and transparency needs to be changed. And, and to change that, we need to have young people who are in public sector work, having been recruited in a professional way, having been trained, having been promoted you know, in accordance with the tenets of good governance, who will be the ones that we carry out these functions? They will be the ones that are going to lead the action to be able to change the perception by their daily actions, by their interactions, or with, with those who are carrying out their duties. It is those young people who will also become the successful political leaders because they will carry with them to higher executive positions, to political elected offices. They will carry with them those values that they have received through the training, mentoring experience and support and compensation that they receive at the levels of their service in mid-government. It's fair to say that in the past, uh, international aid organizations, governments um, and philanthropists have often looked at the failing governments in countries where they're trying to help solve problems and created parallel systems that sort of go around government rather than focus on this issue of trying to build government capacity so that the country can solve its own problems. Um, what, what do you have to say to them about you know, how, how to do this differently and what can philanthropists do to help leaders like yourself that are really serious about this transformational approach to government? absolutely wrong to create a parallel system of policy formulation and program implementation in the country by undermining the capacity of the government to assume the primary responsibility of delivering services to the people and through good governance respecting all those values and principles, accountability, transparency, justice, and fairness, 
That is the responsibility of government. It cannot be undermined by those who do not recognize in a society, the culture, the tradition, and also the responsibility uh, by creating well-intentioned NGOs have, have their own idea of what the priorities that are good for country. And the times when they do not even listen to those who will be affected or benefited by what they do. That takes away from the responsibility of the government to carry out the public service for which they are either elected, appointed, and to which they are committed on the constitution and laws of the country. So very true that one is bound to find cases where a government fails to carry out, that they fall short of the level of integrity that is required. But the thing to do is to strengthen the means of prevention, strengthen the means of punishment, strengthen those institutions that will be able to carry out those functions in accordance with the international standards of good governance. Integrity institutions, not only do they exist, but they can be strengthened. They can be more capacitated. So for serve, but the basics of the, of, of carrying out government functions are, are carried on. If they're not strong enough, then what you do, you really lay the basis for the things that we want to prevent in having good governance because you take away their abilities, their incentives, their passion to be good public servants with integrity and efficiency. So are there ways that you would like to see um, philanthropy engage in, in, in supporting that kind of work? Are there examples that you can point to that have, have stood out? And, and, and are you seeing much change in attitude from philanthropy that reflect your own successes? in doing this work? I think the philanthropy can found partners with the government. It can recognize where the weaknesses are. It can recognize where the gaps are. It can recognize where the limitations are and can certainly work with the government to be able to address those. And that does not take away from continued functioning and the value that non-government organizations bring to countries. But it's ensuring that they are aligned with the government priorities. They are aligned in the programs to carry out the agenda of governments. They participate in recognizing the gaps and the weaknesses and putting into place the measures that will address them. And I can't think of a better place to do it than where the bulk of the service to the people is lodged. That's in the civil service in our country, in Liberia, with a limited budget when I took over and a very undercapacitated workforce, almost 60% of our budgetary resources had to be allocated to paying a workforce that was ill-equipped to carry out the basic functions of government. It's not good enough to give us advisors and a lot of technical assistance, as important, as useful as that is. But that must be an additive to strengthening where the responsibility really lies in the government structures, in its institutions, in its civil service. Thank you. So I want to switch now to uh, a big focus of the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Center, which is to put women at the center of development. 
Can you just say a bit more about why this matters so much to you and what governments can do in terms of understanding why this is uh, central to building strength and resilience in a country? You know, the, the work of the center has its origins in my work in Liberia with the young people. Uh, when we started what we call, I tried to use the, um, to replicate uh, a World Bank program of young professionals. And so that's when we started the President Young Professional Program with this whole focus is in finding people through professional recruitment, professional work, making sure through the merit system, they worked with those young professionals, Liberians from the diaspora in a combined and collective way to deliver efficient public service. Um, the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Center for Women in Development now works with what has become the emerging public leaders, which is the expanded Young Professional Programs of Liberia that has now expanded into Ghana, into Kenya, may go into Cote d'Ivoire and other countries. But we are training women. We have exclusively women and initially training them again through the same process of the PYPP as we call it, and now EPL, the same process of mentoring, bringing those with much more talent and experience to work with those who are on a joining of ascendancy to be able to prepare them to take higher levels of service, of public service, whether it's in the political arena or whether it's in what we hope will be stronger health service given the need to focus on that because of COVID-19 or whether it's in the business sector with young people in small and, and business and small and medium-sized enterprises giving them the sort of training so they have better management skills. It all comes together with one focus, giving young people the opportunities for training, to become professionals, to be properly compensated, incentivized to be able to take the responsibility of public service and to do it in a manner of accountability, transparency, efficiency, and honesty. That's one of the ways also to fight corruption, which continues to be the scourge of all African governments to greater and lesser degree. Now we're almost out of time. And I just wanted to end by asking you um, two short questions. One is what, given the audience that you have today of people who are uh, funders are working for NGOs um, and are very concerned about this issue of good governance. What's the number one thing we should be prioritizing over the next 12 months or so? And lastly, what, what, what makes you feel optimistic about the future in this area? Train the young people to have skills so they can enter either the public or private sector with the level of training and with the incentives to perform efficiently. That recognizes particularly in Africa that the greater number of our population are the young people under 35 years of age that needs this training and need it now to prepare them for the future. What's the other question? Are you optimistic about this? Or what makes you optimistic? I'm, I'm an avid optimist for Africa and for the world. Uh, for Africa, because 
we have a dynamic number of our population that are young, that are very much in touch with technology. They see the digital revolution is the way they will go. And they are also demanding better performance by their governments. And so the walls of um, authoritarianism and dictatorship, as much as they try to re in, in place, re in place the way, reinsert themselves in the past, those walls cannot last with a young population of Africa. And I say that what the, allow, the amount of global inequities and injustices that have been exposed in the world that has so touched the consciences of the world, mean we also will see the thousands of change agents that are calling for reform, that are calling for reflection, that are calling for action to address those global inequities and injustices. And at the heart of this are going to be two groups, no failing, no question about it in my optimism. Women and young will take charge of the world and will create a better world. Well, great. On that wonderfully optimistic note, um, thank you very much, Madam President, for spending time with us this morning, um, or, or my morning in New York and probably your evening in Africa. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to turn thank now to, um, to two people that uh, are going to explain a bit more about the practicalities on the ground of, 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 of building good governance. Um, one is uh, Yawa um, Hansen Kwao and uh, Wei Neng. Um, so if I can turn to both of you now. Um, and the question really I'm going to start uh, to both of you, uh, start with both, uh, both um, Wei and uh, Yawa is to ask you really to describe your organizations a bit in terms of what role you play um, in um, delivering uh, better governance. And I'm going to start, uh, Yawa, if you're there, can I turn to you first? Yes, yeah, sure. And thank you. Greetings from Ghana, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to share a few words about our work. Um, Bridging Public Leaders was really started, uh, as Madam President said, in response to the need to get the right people in the right positions in public service institutions. Our work emanated in Liberia under her presidency um, as our sister organization, the President's Young Professionals Program. And it's really about how do we equip the next generation of public servants so that they have the skills, the, um, the competence, as well as the ethical fortitude to really drive transformation and deliver services to African citizens in a way that's greatly improved. And the reason for this work is also partly because governments are have so many competing priorities. And oftentimes and regrettably, people end up in public service as a result of not necessarily their competence, but because of their connections or because of, um, you know, maybe their, their role as a reward for their political activity. So by introducing this really strong merit-based pathway to get young people into public service, we're disrupting um, those barriers that often exclude women and exclude young people and, and disabled and other communities. And so that's why this work is important. That's why I'm passionate about it. And that's why I believe more governments are inviting us to work with them to do this work well. Now, ordinarily governments would do this, but again, there are competing priorities. And in Africa, majority of our countries are have budgets that are you know, majority covered by donor funding. And to Madam President's point before about those competing priorities, it does take 
a non-governmental agency at times to kind of focus on what needs to be done. And we're finding that as we do this in partnership with governments, they are also investing because it's the right thing to do. They recognize that if countries will move forward, we have to make these investments in, in young people and to build the capacity for public service institutions. And my personal assessment is that Africa really is at a crossroads. Um, we've seen such entrenchment of democracy over the past several decades. My family originally left the continent and you know, spent formative years of my life in the US, partly because of the political instability. But we're seeing that democracy is finding roots here. We're finding that uh, longstanding dictatorships are toppling and the next frontier really is stability in public institutions. Uh, we're seeing that presidents come and go, but it's really the civil service institutions that have the responsibility to implement the policies that will affect the way future generations live. And as a continent that has the youngest population, this is the innovation of the moment. So I think that that's why this work matters. And I think that it's really important that more funders and, and more partners begin to look at it this way. Thank you. I'm going to ask um, uh, Wei Neng to briefly describe what the Chando Institute does and how it plays in this particular space. Sure. Thanks, Matthew. And uh, before I start, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm very aligned with everything that Madam President and Yawa have said, and also um, I think uh, very deeply respect the work that PYPP and EPL have been doing. Uh, so the Chandler Institute of Governance is uh, based in Singapore, but we uh, support governments around the world in capacity development or capability building through research, uh, practical research through training programs and through advisory partnerships. So I think um, where we come from, we have a phrase that we use uh, often and that's trust in governance. So I think this idea here of uh, falling trust in governments and this idea that really governments are in many ways the foundations of national prosperity and national development this is an idea that we hold very closely to us as we partner with governments around the world. And why we say this is that um, as governments do their work, they do their important work, they provide public goods and services, they uh, craft and implement effective laws and policies, that results in a climate of trust among the public and among citizens who believe that the government has their best interests at heart and they believe that the government can deliver and perform so this climate of trust then results in confidence among investors, confidence among businesses to allocate capital and to invest in the country. It gives people the confidence to work and the ability and the security to save money, invest in their families and their children's futures. So in many ways, we see good governance as being a foundation of prosperity. And so we seek in our small way to support governments, as Madam President and Yawa have said, to strengthen their capabilities very important that we don't uh, uh, erode or take away from the legitimacy and the responsibility of governments, but instead we strengthen them to do their work. And just a little more detail, what, what are the sort of ways in which you're helping governments at the moment specifically? So we have uh, several partnerships with uh, various governments, uh, such as the government of Vietnam, the government of Punjab, and uh, some government agencies in Zambia. So these range uh, from training programs, leadership development programs, to advisory partnerships on um, specific challenges. So as Madam President said, to listen deeply to the challenges that governments are facing and to see where we can support them in addressing those challenges, to work side by side with them, not just at the level of strategy development, but also at the level of execution and implementation. So for instance, it could be something like uh, designing and supporting them with implementing meritocratic performance appraisal systems, or it could be helping their national schools of government to uh, design and conduct good training programs for their officers. Uh, the race to the range is quite great, depending on the needs of our government partners. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm very struck by, you know, I think there's a, a, a common issue around the world that people are young people are reluctant to go into government because they perceive it to be either a sort of less exciting career, a career that's more um, 
beset by sort of institutional inertia and that you can't get things done and that actually maybe the ethics of people uh, there you know uh, re related to madam president's article about kleptocrats to technocrats that there's a, a sort of rotten culture in government how do you see how do we change that that attitude and attract people to, to do to do things like become part of emerging public leaders and go into government you're right, Matthew, that many young people around the world, and particularly in Africa, do not necessarily see government as a viable career pathway. And there are several reasons for that. Um, you've mentioned some of them, but what we're finding is that when you create an environment where there's trust in the recruitment process. You know, the foundation of our work through our public service fellowship is to drive recruitment through a merit-based model. When people understand exactly the criteria they, that will be used to assess them, when they understand that pathway to their next promotion, when they understand the architecture of support that's available to them, when we deliberately provide these intergenerational mentoring relationships that enable them to learn and to grow in the role, you find that many young people raise their hand because the pathway is clearer than it really, it normally is. And so we're finding that in Liberia, in Ghana, and in Kenya, where we are soon to launch, that by taking this approach that focuses on a merit-based recruitment, on a very stringent performance management process, on an established mentorship curriculum and process for, for training that is responsive to the needs of the government so that people know they can grow in the job, people know that they can qualify for promotions and advance relatively quickly, it makes it easier for young people to say yes. And that's important because every country needs its best and brightest in public service. So part of what I think is our role as an organization and through this work is that we're diverting that talent, that great superior talent that often gets lost to private sector, to the government sector. And it's important that that happens because when we look at these new challenges and you know, this moment is teaching us that you have to prepare before the crisis occurs. And as we look at some of the stories coming out of our um, network in Liberia, you know, having a decade's worth of cohorts of young professionals in the Liberian government was such a great response mechanism for Ebola. Um, that that trusted network was already there, already in place, already trusted, and they were on the front lines just as they are now with COVID response. We have fellows here in Ghana who are also demonstrating same, majority of whom have been deemed essential staff. We have a fellow, for example, who's part of the contact tracing team at the Ministry of Health in Accra, and after barely a week in the field, he was pulled into the command center because he was the only one that had the skill set to analyze the data and to help the senior leadership in the in the ministry make decisions about where to deploy the contact tracing teams. So you've got young people with absolutely critical skills that government needs who now have a pathway that's merit-based and have an that makes it while stay in this that changes the for the kind of service delivery that governments can benefit from. And I'm pleased as well that as we continue to do this work, that more partners are beginning to recognize the power of this, that governments aren't roadblocks to be bypassed, but they're actually important and integral partners to bring innovation to scale and to make sure that the investments that you make in any other sector are long lived. So I think that that's part of how you solve this, the problem. And we're seeing it in these three countries in which we're working. And I'm excited because just as Madam President said, I do believe that the, the youth the relative view of Africa really where it and if we divert this energy, this skill set to government service, the the 
the future of the continent will be much more secure. Thanks, and Wayne, Wayne Eng, I mean, how, same question to you really, how do we, what can be done to change the perception of government so that it does become more attractive to young people to go into that work? Certainly building a culture that um, and a perception that uh, career and service in the public service is something to be proud of and something to aspire to. I think that's very important. Uh, and to do that, I think uh, certainly training opportunities, clear pathways to progress as what's been said so far. So I totally um, align myself with that. Um, training as part of a holistic people development system. Uh, with good performance reviews, meritocratic pay, meritocratic promotion, transfers, disciplinary action, the, the, you know, it's, it's a whole system that has to work together. And I think that governments are also um, have some advantages in the sense that the work of public service is uh, intrinsically meaningful to many bright talented people. So if we can find ways to harness that, that uh, intrinsic motivation of young talented people who want to serve their nations, that will be um, something in our favor. So in terms of the types of training that are, I think, most relevant for this kind of uh, culture building, um, I, what we've seen so far is that the types of uh, skills and development training are not the uh, academic theoretical kind of training, but they're very practical trade craft of government and skills that will help uh, civil servants to succeed. So I think if we do all that and we show and guide and support young civil servants to succeed, uh, I, I don't see, a, um, I mean, of course, you know, political will is also very important. Support from the leadership, um, you know, e EPL, uh, PYPP succeeded because of political will from top leadership. I think that's very important to, as a foundation for initiatives like this. Thanks. I, I want to ask both of you about what philanthropy can do in this area, because I think as we, as was discussed with, with Madam President earlier, I mean, often philanthropy has not wanted to get involved in the issues of building up government capacity. Instead, there's often been a, a, an approach that's about more about building parallel solutions or bypassing government in different ways. What are you seeing that, that you think would be a high return on philanthropic investment? And, and I'll start with Yawa and then, then ask Wena. Well, Matthew, quite frankly, I think investments in building government capacity through programs like emerging public leaders is smart. I do think that when I look at the, you know, as an executive director of a nonprofit, you know, as I think about the things that keep me up at night, it's not so much that I'm concerned about our why. I think our why is important. I think that in, in the midst of a moment like this, I worry that a lot of funders are talking a good game about the need to invest in government, but not really backing that up with action. I also worry that philanthropy can sometimes become very, and I'm trying to choose my words delicately, but, but, but I think that, you know, sometimes it's perceived that um, decisions about who gets funded are predetermined. And as a, you know, woman of color and a, you know, leader of an African organization, sometimes I do feel a little disadvantaged in, in terms of whether there is a level playing field to be heard and to be, you know, really taken seriously. And I think that more funders, you know, should build trust with the organizations that are on the ground and have context in a way that, you know, funders are a little further removed from. And I think that the last and final piece would be an openness to unrestricted funding that allows an organization to build itself while it delivers the work. Because I'm sure many nonprofit executive directors, particularly in a moment like this, are experiencing the tension of having to fly the plane and build the plane, you know, build the plane while you're flying it, which is, you know, unfortunate, uh, an unfortunate dance that you have to do. And I think that organizations like Chandler, I, I greatly appreciate that this 
conversation is being, you know, elevated. Um, and I think a few weeks ago, Tim, the founder, uh, sorry, the CEO at Chandler, reflected that in his previous life as a social entrepreneur, had it not been for a 10-year unrestricted grant that he received to really focus on building his, his nonprofit, he's not sure it would have been as successful as it was. So I, I encourage funders to think more long-term when it comes to the support that organizations need. And it's not just funding. Um, we've had the benefit, I think, of, at emerging public leaders of having some wonderful partnerships who have been, you know, more than just signers of checks, but advisors and supporters who've been in trenches with us. And I think that that approach is what's needed in a moment like this. And I hope that more funders will be open to that. Thank you, and, and Wayne. Thanks. So um, Yawa's made some very good points about funders. Now, uh, CIG is not a foundation, so maybe I'll speak a bit more directly about organizations and nonprofits that work directly with governments or they seek to want to work more directly with governments and maybe just some suggestions uh, for consideration. I think the first is that, of course, there's a, a bit of a natural, uh, maybe a natural hesitation on the part of many governments to uh, work with nonprofits. And uh, speaking as someone who's uh, served for 15 years in the Singapore government, I can understand a little bit of that. Sometimes a strange NGO comes up to us and says, we want to partner with you and there's some natural hesitation. So I think it's incumbent on us, now that I'm on the other side of the table, uh, to make sure we build credibility, we build trust, make sure we're non-partisan, independent, as free from ideological bias as possible, very pragmatic and very focused. I think that builds credibility over time. I think the second, um, I guess, suggestion I might have is uh, which has already been uh, said, is to listen deeply and with humility. I think that's uh, without any preconceived ideas or solutions or one-size-fits-all frameworks, uh, listen to challenges and needs and then uh, tailor uh, solutions and partner together to implement solutions. So I think um, the third is perhaps to enlist and work closely with government practitioners. If we're going to want to support governments, we need to have government practitioners in our teams as well. So there's a lot of... Uh, uh, trade craft, a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience that former government practitioners can bring to the table when nonprofits partner with governments. And just very quickly, the last thing is always to let the government partners shine and give them the credit because they're the ones doing the heavy lifting. They're the ones doing the hard work of get, clearing the legislation, implementing the policies. We seek to support them, but never to uh, you know take, take their, their limelight. Thank you. Well, look, unfortunately, we're already um, up on time. And so um, I'm afraid we're going to have to bring this excellent conversation to an end just as we're really getting going. Um, and I apologize to people who written in questions that we haven't been able to get to. But I'd like to thank both uh, Yawa and, and Weining for, for their insights, as well as obviously the, the inspirational comments from Madam President. Um, you know, I'm very struck in as I as I'm thinking about what I've heard that you know we are at a moment in time where the importance of government has been made very clear um, the pandemic and and the experience of living under sort of inept populist governments has really shown the difference that a the good government can make and that, and that too often we haven't got that at the moment and I'm very struck by what you both said and what the president said about uh, how this challenge of, of investing in the capacity of government has too often been neglected um, by the international aid donors, by philanthropy, and that um, probably also been neglected even in many countries that thought they, were, they had very effective government systems in the developed world as well as in emerging economies. And so there's a challenge all around the world of how do we build up the capacity of government and make a career in civil service and public service attractive to young people again and it seems to me that you know your 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 experiences are very relevant all around the world to to those thinking about how do we build back better out of this mess that we find ourselves in at the moment and that and the, and the building the capacity of government really should be at, at the top of that and and you've given us two practical uh, examples of how to do that so I'd like to thank you both and I'd like to thank Madam President again I'd like to thank Chandler for Foundation for hosting uh, us all today and I'm really just 
I think the message could not be clearer that that there is tremendous talent amongst the young people of the world and we need to find ways to engage them in, in being involved in government and public service and if we do we can be looking forward as Madam President was to a, a much more exciting future than I think sometimes we're feeling is possible at the moment so 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 I'm urging everyone listening in today to to, to rise to this challenge and thank you both for the work that you do and Madam President for the work that you do. So with that, um, you know, thank you all. And uh, unless Tim has uh, any final comments, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll end um, this conversation and, and I look forward to staying in touch with you later. So thank you everyone for joining.